Hey everyone, welcome to the Inside Gaming Review for Layers of Fear 2. Oh boy, I'm excited for this one. I'm a huge fan of Layers of Fear, so let's mm. get into it. We got Alana here, Hi. Alana, and Caden is dialing all the way in from halfway across the world. Hey oh, Texas is not that far away. Oh, uh, isn't it? Nope. Oh. <laughs> so, this is an interesting game because kind of like Silent Hill, a lot of it is kind of metaphysical, a lot of symbolism in games like this. So we're gonna try to stay away from talking about the concrete, like, layers of the, the story. <laughs> because discovering it's half the fun. Uh, your first hours with the game, especially in regards to story and identity, are going to be very confusing. They don't really tell you who you are or what you're doing, but you're on a boat, a weird boat, uh, and you just start going down hallways and stuff. Uh, and I think one of my favorite things about the opening hours of the game is that uh, nothing actually scary happens. Mm -hmm. So I'm terrified of Layers of Fear 2, uh, but I've realized that I'm scared because I'm projecting possibilities onto things that won't necessarily mean anything. And it gets you into that space really easily because environments change so much that, say, if you haven't played the first one, a lot of it is walking through a door, you turn around, the door's not there anymore, there's a new hallway instead, or walking through a hallway and when you turn around there is a door. So it's it basically, a lot of the environments are very, very unpredictable and you never feel safe. It's just constantly terrifying because you don't know what's going to happen, even if nothing is actually happening other than a door changing. So to me, that means that I always assume the worst and I'm terrified <laughs> of everything all the time, which is kind of my own fault. Yeah, it's very good about playing with your expectation. Uh, if you played Layers of Fear 1, Layers of Fear 2, thematically, stylistically, is actually pretty similar. So Layers of Fear 1, uh, minor spoilers, I guess, it's kind of about a painter who's going insane, mm -hmm. and you're basically wandering through that house as that character, basically as your mind is getting deconstructed, and you eventually learn about your past as your character and what you've done in reality. Uh, similar in Layers of Fear 2. Uh, again, don't want to say too much about it, but it is kind of the same thing. It's kind of about an artist exploring their craft and the sort of uh, manifestation of what that process is. Uh, I don't know, Caden, what, what, so what is your experience with the Layers of Fear series and how do you feel about this game in terms of the story and the characters and stuff like that? So I absolutely loved the first Layers of Fear game so much and I, I played through all the DLC and all the extra updates for it. So this is more of the same. It's all about that anticipation for what's around the corner and sometimes it's it's nothing. In most cases, it's actually nothing, but that's what hypes up that fear a little bit more. Layers of Fear 2 actually does have that monster, which Layers of Fear 1 didn't. So you do have that chase element, but it's not afraid to tell you, hey, you actually should be running away right now instead of putzing around with some puzzle or some like random piece of paper that's strewn across the floor or something like that. So this is a nice evolution for what we got in the first game, and it's really more nuanced in the first game game, so I'm really digging it. A lot more layered. Yes, hey, we're gonna say that a lot. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, let's get into the actual gameplay, like what you do with a controller. Uh, Layers of Fear 1 was a lot of spooky hallways. It was basically a big virtual haunted house, but because it was a video game, it could get kind of non-Euclidean about it, like play with space, play with perception and things like that. And it was really good at being unsettling. This one has a little more like actual buttons, like actual gameplay. There's a lot of doors in that regard. It actually kind of feels similar to PT, a lot of hallways and doors. What I like is that it's got that thing where like you grab a door and then you have to use the mouse or the stick to open it. And you can like kind of open it a little bit to peek through. It just feels a little more tactile is I guess the word. And since what all you're doing in this game is basically grabbing a thing and moving it, it's kind of nice that they added just a little touch more interactivity there. It feels a little more physical to like grab a door and slam it open or very gently creak it open. Yeah, and I want to mention really quick, uh, because I know you played on keyboard and mouse, I actually did play on controller, so I played on Xbox, and the triggers sometimes, uh, based on what's happening in the environment, will give you the force feedback. Oh man, I didn't get that. Which scared me a lot, actually. Uh. <laughs> so I wasn't expecting it, and that's a benefit of playing with a controller, I guess, just in this one instance, is that, you know, like a vase falls over, and it, it the trigger is what actually scared me, even though both things are happening at once. And I, I like that. It's just a nice touch to giving the game a feeling. I played on PS4 Pro, actually, and I had the exact same experience where oh. I was actually more scared of the controller's reactions to than the things that were actually going on. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there are, there are some puzzles, uh, but they're pretty minor so far. I haven't finished it. I'm at the end of Act 3. Caden, how far did you get? I actually beat it, Ooh. but I found out that there's multiple endings, so I'm going to have to go back and do the rest of them. The choices you make and the things that happen throughout the game affect what's actually happening in the story. So 
you actually have more influence over what's going on than you think you do. So I was curious about that because, yeah, in addition to some minor puzzles, which is really just, you know, like hit this button, pull this lever, there's really only like one way to do them. And it's fun to mess with stuff, but it's not that cerebrally challenging. There are decision points where it's it's a lot of like, do this or that. And usually the UI will make it very clear. Are those the like branching paths? Because sometimes there's like two doors to go through and one is like a spooky door and one's a normal door. There's a lot of locked doors. So usually there's only just one, but sometimes there is a path. Sometimes one just goes to unlockables like movie posters and little like pickup slides and stuff. So Caden, I'm curious, in your playthrough, did you get the sense that those like A or B decisions were the ones that forked the story? The A and B decisions definitely affect some ending. They did in the first Layers of Fear as well, where it's like, hey, here's the good ending, bad ending, middle ending, whatever. But there's got to be another ending that's tied to collectibles or something like that, because the first game had something very similar where, hey, you need all these little things to get the full true ending of it all. So I'm expecting that you need to make the right decisions and then get all the collectibles and then you get the perfect ending. Jeez, okay. I mean, I think that adds a, another gameplay layer to... Yeah. Damn it, <laughs> I didn't even mean to do that <laughs> one. To a game that was otherwise... I mean, people could call it a walking simulator, the first one. They yeah. could. Like, I would disagree because I think that it's a lot more than that and it's amazing visual storytelling and very good writing. But in this case, I think that it, it does give you more depth. I'm trying not to say the word layer again. Uh -huh. Well, so that's and good. to Caden's point too, there is a fail state. You can die. Well, die. It just kicks you back to a checkpoint. But yes, there are moments where you're harried by some horrible static monster. And I'm of two minds on those sequences. It is interesting and certainly high tension to be chased and have the possibility of failure. And certainly the like graphics and sound design make those sequences very intense. But there are also times where, especially like my turn speed was really low. Okay. So there were times where I would like turn the wrong way. And by the time like, I was like, yanking yeah, back around the other way, the guy had already got me. I think it's clunky, is what I was going to say. So I like the idea of chase sequences. I think that's one of the only things in the entire game that is executed in a way that's kind of average. Uh, it's not executed great. It's just that you, you don't feel like you have full control over where you're trying to go a lot of the time, and you're panicked at the same time, and it just doesn't feel very fluid. Yes. Uh, I think the game is more tuned for the slow, moody, oppressive exploration, because yeah. it feels really good there. Your turn speed is really slow and smooth. Your walking speed and your head bob is all very, like, kind of weighted and rooted, which feels good because you move through some very very existential areas in this game. So yeah, but when when suddenly they try to ratchet that same up into a high tension chase scenario, it doesn't quite click like it should. I don't know, Caden, what was your experience with that? Honestly, it feels a lot like, uh, oh, this is a long shot, uh, Silent Hill Shattered Memories for the Wii, yeah. where there's so much to do in the overworld and there's so many things to explore, and then you get locked into this run away from the thing, and yeah, it's great and it makes you tense and scared and everything like that, but if the monster's not really interesting to look at or run away from, from, then what's the point? Not to mention all the hallways kind of like loop around and sometimes how to actually get away from the monster is really obscure and it puts you into this death loop consistently. So you're getting frustrated through that. But I really liked the exploration and moody horror aspects more than running away from it. Does the presence of that monster, the visualization of that monster have some greater meaning by the end of the game? Or is it just static monster? Uh, Sort of is kind of the answer to that. Great. Okay, we'll take it. That's the perfect answer. <laughs> All right, so moving on from there, kind of talking about the game's visuals and stuff. I cannot say enough amazing things about how this game looks. Beautiful. Yes. I, I wouldn't, like, it's, it's not a technical masterpiece, but what it does, it does so well because it's more of a, a victory in art design. The interiors that you walk through are amazing. They're, they're perfectly sized to give you that kind of otherworldly, like Inception dreamlike sensibility. Yeah, and I think at first I was a little worried that environments would get repetitive, but then the game changes all the time. Yes. You'll every, see stuff outside that you would never have expected to see. Yeah, every every act is kind of a new theme, and those themes are, are like Alana said, wildly different. You have almost like Silent Hill-esque, like metal grade and rusted walls with machinery and steam. You have Metropolis style, like automatons working old machinery. Uh, we didn't mention at this point, this game theoretically takes place sometime in the like 1920s and 30s, the advent of cinema. Yeah. So there's a lot of references to old cinema. It, it'll go grayscale, uh, which looks amazing. Uh, it'll go like sepia tone, which also looks very cool. They find a great way to pull a lot of very evocative imagery and just unsettling, like just imagery of all kinds. Paintings that are just weird and broken. Mm -hmm. A lot of like, 
like mannequins that are twisted. Like mannequins get used a lot because they're creepy, but they they find some way to do some new stuff. But they still creepy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the like the drop frame rate animation they'll do for some monsters. So the game will be running at a rock solid 60, and then a jittery like 10 FPS monster guy will start shambling out, and it looks awfully amazing. Yeah, they uh, they put a lot of thought into all of it. And I just wanted to ask Caden, does the variety of environments stay until the end of the game? So yes, it does, and there's something that you kind of notice as you play through the game. The ship is really this central thing. Uh, we may not have mentioned it, but you're playing on this giant ship for some reason. As the chapters go on, you're going further and further and further into the bowels of this ship, and it gets more and more like decrepit and like messed up as time goes on. But you do have these other variants of things, like you know the the stage show and this like mechanical world and this metropolis thing. And it does change up a bit, but it's more like it, everything is slowly deteriorating as you progress. Cool. Yeah. That is one of the weirder parts, kind of going back to the themes in the story, is that there are equal amounts of very like legitimate direct explanations for what's going on, but then also ways in which that can't be true. It starts with this construct, uh, this like framing device of you're an actor and a director has put you on this boat to discover a character. You have to develop a character for some movie you don't know what. And, th and there are notes talking about how the crew has been instructed to not go down on the decks that you're on. So okay, there's like a physical reason why there's no one else around. But then yeah, you, you go like 60 feet down into a boat and find like a set piece of another boat on the boat that has been wrecked and it's just, it, it's like spaces that can't be real mixed with explanations about how all this could potentially be real. It's, it's very bizarre. Well, the way that the narrative ties into the design is the most important part of this yes. game and I want to say it's almost flawless. Like I was so impressed by it every single second that I played and that everything that I was hearing through audio, which I'm sure we'll get to, mm -hmm. and then everything that I was seeing just pair together so, so, so well that it's, it's, it seems like a triumph. Like the fact that they managed to pull it together is, is beautiful. It's so cohesive. Hell yeah. Well, you mentioned sound. Let's get right Let's get to it. Sound. Jesus Christ. Oh my God. So I want to say 80% of good horror is sound. It's, it's that inspiring your imagination to think about things that are far worse than they end up being. Um, there are some like intense stings and jump scares. They don't feel super cheap though. And there aren't a lot of them either. Yeah, it's it's mostly the the, uh, the worry about them happening rather than the reality of them happening Absolutely. that gets you. Long hallways that are just dead quiet aside from your footsteps. And then just like loud clanging, roaring stuff that's you don't see. Sometimes it doesn't mean knocking anything. Knocking footsteps. Yeah, sometimes it's just there to mess with you. In yeah. that regard, very evocative of Silent Hill for a number of reasons. So Caden mentioned Shattered Memories, which I think is a great reference. Uh, I think you were talking about the safe room mm -hmm. that eventually starts to change, kind of like Silent Hill 4. Uh, there are just what sound like giant monstrosities just on the other side of a wall, which I know that's like Silent Hill 2 did a lot. Yeah. Of just like horrible things you can hear but not see. That's kind of it at max tension when it gets ratcheted down a little. It's just generally unsettling. There's a lot of stuff like say there's an item that you need to pick up in a room before you can oh. progress and you'll just hear some whispering. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the tell like, that there's an item Why is there whispering? And then you're like, let me turn it off, god damn it. So you're looking for an item or sometimes you'll hear a door open and you didn't do it and then the door's open. It's just like really subtle things that cue you into what you're supposed to be doing in the game. But the sound is what's getting me more than anything else still. Yeah, and the voice acting is incredible. Like Very the writing good. is on point and the voice acting is all super, super good. There's and a, a wide variety of characters too. There's like a innocent young British child there's like an old gravelly voice, uh, kind of omniscient narrator. It's It's got a wide diversity of, of voices and voice talent, and they all fill a really good role into filling out the kind of emotional uh, completeness of the game. Okay, Caden, what are your thoughts about the audio audioscape of this game? So the soundtrack is amazing. I actually left it on just to listen to it for a while, and it's, it's creepy, it's atmospheric, and it sets the mood perfectly. It's not like Halloween or anything like that that's jump scary in sounds. This is really setting the tone for what you're actually seeing. It, it matches everything perfectly. And um, similar to what you were saying, it's like sometimes, you know, you're trying to get a clue of what to do. You hear those little whispers and murmurs and then, oh, hey, here's a collectible to pick up because I heard those whispers and murmurs. But there was one point where I was kind of uh, a little turned around and I thought I was hearing my own footsteps. I stopped moving and then I heard more footsteps and I just decided to follow the sound pattern. And as it got louder, I was like, oh, here's where I'm supposed to go. Here's this creepy little boy sitting atop a dresser and it's just like clicking his feet back and forth. It's like, great. I I determined that this is the way to go and I'm utterly terrified by it. Yeah, yeah I remember that sequence. That was bad. Every time you hear something before you see it, it's like your imagination is always much worse. Oh, and this whole game, mm -hmm. that's why I'm so scared of it. Exactly. Finally, let's talk about the controls a little bit. We already talked about it a little bit, how, how like 
I feel like it is well tuned to maybe more ex exploration than like running or, or anything like that. I like the interaction aspect. I like I like pulling levers and sliding things. It's uh, there's this mobile game series called The Room, where basically all you're doing is like moving stuff around oh, and yeah, solving puzzles. The room. Yeah, yeah, I like it a lot. It's there's something very you, fun about just interacting with clunky, clunky machines, and this game has a lot of that. Today, Personally, in that regard, I could have used a little more hands. a little more interaction. Uh, there are times where they they like close you in a room with an interactable object, some kind of weird machine that you, have to, you learn how to operate, which really just comes down That's to hitting right. buttons in a random order until you find Don't the right, right series of levers to you know, pull and then a door opens and you can continue on. There's not a whole lot of logical design yes. or flow to the Show puzzles. I would have strong. liked something a little more cerebral like in that me. regard. But at the same time, I kind of get like it would be a huge bummer if somebody were really feeling the game and then they got actually stuck. So I kind of, I, I think it works with the flow of the game to just make it kind of a, a direct thing that anyone, if they just hit random stuff, they'll eventually get through. Yeah. I kind of like the puzzly stuff. Um, again, I think I also would have preferred a little more puzzles, but I also recognize that's not what this game is going for, so mm -hmm. I'm split there, but it's also, yeah, some of the puzzles that do exist, in some cases, felt a little bit like a waste of time. It was some of them I was like, it was so simple that why? I would have preferred to spend that time walking around the boat, but mm -hmm. that's a very minor criticism. Yeah, there was there was one where there was like a weird shadow plant and just a bunch of other stuff in the room. And it was like, smack the plant. Did anything happen? No. Okay, turn some stuff off, turn this knob, smack it again. And there wasn't really a whole lot of logical flow to it. It looked cool, but it was really just hit random stuff until you figure out how to move forward. So, yeah. you know, I appreciated the downtime because at least when you're doing that, you can be reasonably Maybe. sure that you're not going to get carried by a static monster. That is true. Uh, Kaden, how do you feel about the controls and how you interact maybe. with the world. Okay, so maybe it's just me, but I hated the controls in the first game, but I adored the game. And this kind of fixed pretty much everything about the actual controlling of the game. Everything felt more fluid, doors opened better, there was no really clunking around too much, and it really felt like playing PT demo all over again. So I really enjoyed that, and maybe it's just because I really, really wanted PT to be real and exist, but this is pretty much everything I wanted from a sequel for two layers of fear. Yeah, well, uh, before we wrap up, Caden, like, what are your, you know, you finished it, what, what are your closing thoughts, like, your highest highs and lowest lows, if you have them, or who would you recommend it to? Highest highs, the game takes you on a journey. If you really like uh, a horror story, this is a great one. Lowest lows, the first act kind of drags a bit, but once you get really into, you know, act two and three, it starts ramping things up, and by the end, you are completely enraptured by this very weird weird ship stage thing. If you like the first Layers of Fear and you're a huge horror fan, this is an absolute grab. Uh, if you're interested in playing horror games in general, this one's a good one to start with, to be honest, too. Hmm. I, I agree. For 30 bucks, it's it's hard to find the person who wouldn't have a good time with this game unless they just want to shoot stuff. They hate horror. Yeah, or, <laughs> or they just hate being scared. I mean, there's that, too. But uh, a lot of the references Caden are throwing out are 100% accurate. It is, it is sort of a visitation of what PT might look like as a full game. It never quite hits the level of just intensity and terror that PT did, or even for the, in that regard, like maybe a Silent Hill, because those get really grotesque. Um, is that fair? That's that's pretty fair. The final act can get pretty weird and gruesome, but hmm. uh, yeah, you're right. It's never as as brutal as, say, Silent Hill. But still, I think there's a lot of spiritual similarity to some of the greats in the genre. Silent Hill, I mean, basically mostly Silent Hill is what honestly it reminds me of. So. I think a lot of it is derivative of film, too. It feels like silent films to me, even though there is audio logs and that there is audio. It's it, A lot of it feels like spooky silent films. 100%. And, and and that's perfectly fitting for the theme of the game. It's yeah. about early cinema. So I would recommend this, yeah, to anyone who has a passing interest in horror. Luckily, the uh, the control scheme is simple enough that, that anyone who likes a spooky thing can be able to play it. And just visually, it is such a, a amazing reinterpretation and love letter to early cinema, both in like the set design and the pieces you walk through and how they're lit and colored. And oh my gosh, what a, what a visual treat. And, and yeah, for, for 30 bucks, you can get a good five evenings. I've been playing like one act a night because by the end of the act, I'm like, okay, I'm a little frazzled right now. I'll Need put to it watch down for a bit. cartoon and go to bed. Yeah, basically. So, I, I, yeah, it's it's tough to find people who wouldn't enjoy this game aside from, like you said, they just flat don't like it on premise alone. Yeah. But I it, actually think it's probably the best game I've played so far this year. <gasps> but Sekiro yep. came out this year. But Sekiro has a broken camera, and sometimes the lock-on doesn't work. Oh my gosh. Like I love Sekiro, but it has like slightly more flaws, I think, than this game does. Damn, that's high praise. And so. I also really love the Resident Evil 2 remake, so those would be like my top three, but I think this is the best made consistently for what it tries to do, what it is, and how well it executes on it. Damn, all right, well, Goaty 2019 for Alana. 
Caden, <laughs> would you say it's like one of the best you've played this year? Actually, I kind of agree. Yeah, it's easily one of the best games I've played this year so far. I can't help but agree as well. Uh, I think in terms of writing, visual presentation, audio, gameplay, it's kind of the whole package. Mm -hmm. it, it is exactly what it wants to be, and it's a great version of that. So, yeah, you know, get some friends around. Have a nice spooky evening in. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be fun. But, yeah, thank you guys for making the game. Thanks for hooking us up with review access. And thank you for watching this review. Please go play the game, and we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Today we're reviewing Team Sonic Racing, yes. and as such, we have our resident Sonic scholar on hand. Thank you James. very much. James the Hedgehog is here thank in the you. flesh. I'm also resident Sonic Racing game scholar, too. That's true. So. Now, yeah, it's good that you lean into that. So uh, you were a huge fan of Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. Yes. I Tried to convince all of us.